Welcome to this ADF Insider presentation. My name's Chris Muir, I'm a Senior Principal ADF Product Manager at Oracle Corporation and today we'll be looking at using Apache JMeter to load test ADF applications. In today's presentation we'll be having an introduction, or a very brief introduction on Apache JMeter and ADF um, load and stress testing. We'll then be looking at using a pre-configured JMeter test plan for load testing an ADF application that I've pre-built. We'll look at recording that ADF session, running the JMeter load test, and then concluding by looking at some resources and alternative solutions to Apache JMeter. So what is Apache JMeter? Well, Apache JMeter, which comes from the Apache Foundation, is a free tool for essentially recording an ADF, uh, I should say any HTTP session with a server out there via your browser. You record that session in JMeter and then you can replay it 1, 10, 50, 1,000 times concurrently to put load and stress on that external server. Apache JMeter is particularly suited to load, stress and performance testing of web applications. This is what its uh, key um, um, goal is. However, a little caveat, it is not suited to functional testing of applications. Um, you could set it up to do such functional testing, but it's very, very configuration heavy. And as a result, you'll find it's too much work to um, set up functional tests to make sure your application is doing what you want to do, what you want it to do in terms of requirements. But rather, what it's very well suited to do is essentially already recording sessions, recording a session of an interaction with your application, then scaling that session up to maybe five users, ten users, a thousand users to see if your server can actually deal with the load. Um, I am putting the emphasis on this tool is very very configuration heavy. It's not suited to um, all sorts of testing out there. It's also not suited to people who don't have an understanding of the HTTP protocol and how ADF works. It is very um, tricky and um, maybe difficult to get right. However the caveat to that, or the, maybe the um, the thing, the most enticing thing about Apache JMeter is it is a free tool though. There's no essential vendor um, license cost associated with this tool, so that makes it very enticing. Now, in the presentation today, in considering Apache JMeter, we're going to look at it for load and stress testing an ADF application. Now, what I'm going to show you is how to pre-configure Apache JMeter to load and stress test an ADF application, but what I'm not going to do is go through how to use Apache JMeter and you know use all its uh, different features. If you want to use Apache JMeter in its full capacity, please go to the manual. Okay, um, over a number of years since I've worked with Apache JMeter and blogged and written articles on it, I've got lots of questions beyond just how to configure Apache JMeter for ADF, like how do I, when we're rerunning a test, get it to change the data that it's submitting to an ADF application. A very worthy question, but that's what you go to the Apache manuals for. Okay, you need to learn how to use Apache Meter and uh, Apache JMeter in uh, in detail to get the full use of it. Today's presentation is just looking at the pre-configuration of a JMeter um, test plan in order to test and uh, load test and stress test an ADF application. So in Taking that on board, what we're going to do now is literally go to JMeter and look at a pre-configured JMeter JMX test plan for actually testing an ADF application. So this test plan will essentially give you all the pre-configured bits that you need in order to uh, get JMeter to actually load and uh, stress test an ADF application. Okay, so what we have here is a Windows Explorer view onto my local file system. What you will notice is I've installed, um, effectively I've downloaded Apache JMeter, the current version at the time of this presentation was 2.7. I've downloaded it and unzipped it to this Oracle directory then Apache JMeter 2.7. You then go to the bin directory and you find the jmeter.bat file and you execute that particular file. This will load Apache JMeter. And Apache JMeter, in essence, has the concept of test plans. And a test plan is essentially a recording of a session or a bunch of HTTP requests that you set up that you want to replay. Now, in considering this, the test plan, I've already provided, or um, essentially um, pre-configured, a JMeter JMX test file for ADF that you can make use of yourself. At the end of the presentation, I'll give you the URL for downloading that. But let's see what happens when we open that. 
So when we open that, what the first thing we get is in the test plan, our test plan is called let's break something, and within that we have a thread group. And this is one of the core ideas of loaded stress testing by JMeter, that essentially we'll record one ADF session in, in, in the moment, but essentially we'll then rerun that ADF session with maybe one thread or 10 threads or 100 threads to effectively simulate a number of different users. And you can see the thread group actually has the number of threads we can spawn, um, the delay between the threads that we're spawning up or the user sessions, and then we can even do things like sequentially rerun those sessions a number of times. Now, for this presentation, at the moment, I'm only going to deal with rerunning essentially one user or one thread group, or one thread, I should say. We're not going to try and overload our ADF application straight away, because we haven't really understood the complexities or, or the configurations of JMeter at this stage. Now, in loading that test plan, what we've also got underneath is a number of pre-configured elements for you to work with an ADF application. One of the first things you need is a HTTP cookie manager. Why? Because ADF makes use of a Java EE J session ID cookie that it passes around in the background. So the cookie manager here will automatically take care of when we run an ADF session via JMeter, it will take care of passing that cookie around for us. We also need to set up a HTTP header manager. This is just a little manager in the test plan that when you send a request to the ADF application and it comes back with a response, in that response it will have a bunch of HTTP key value header, uh, header um, uh, values and the header manager will take care of just managing those for us. What's much more important, however, in this test plan is these ADF variables and these regular extract, uh, expression extractors. You'll see in the ADF variables here, we have uh, up to six variables that we're going to keep track of. Now, what these variables are, or what they will store, is when we make a request on the ADF application, it will return to the JMeter in the next response, potentially up to these six variables with values for them. And those values on the next request, we might then be forced to send them back down to the server from JMeter. So these are effectively the state variables that ADF and the browser effectively share with each other, which ADF on the server keeps track of users to keep track of the user. It effectively uses it to work out who you are and what you're currently doing in the application. Now, if we did not actually keep track of these values and pass them backwards and forwards between JMeter, which is effectively you know, this pseudo browser application here, and the ADF server, Effectively, when the ADF server gets the next request coming in, in, in terms of a session, in a number of uh, requests, HP request responses, it will say, well, I've got a token value here, and I don't, um, I just, I expect this value, but I don't know who you are. I don't understand why you didn't give me that value. You must be a user that I don't know. And then it will, what typically ADF then does is either start throwing exceptions, or it says that the user is inactive, and so on. So these variables are very important in terms of the interactions with the ADF server. Now, these are the variables that we're actually going to store in the running thread group, but how are they actually populated? Well, it's these regular expression extractors that do the real smarts here. We have, as you can see, a regular expression extractor called ADF control state extractor, AF loop extractor, AF window extractor, and so on. And these extractors, these regular expression extractors will be uh, are designed to populate these variables, which will then be pushed back into the next request going to the actual ADF server. If you look at each one of these extractors, you'll notice it has options to say, hey, when we get a response from the server, where should we go and find, or where should we run this regular expression extractor from? Okay, in this case, it's the body of the payload coming back. In addition, what should we actually search for? And this is this regular expression uh, that you can see here. In the response coming from the server, we're going to look for a string that starts with underscore adf.control-state equals, and then we have an actual regular expression that says essentially, okay, in the string that's coming back, I'm looking for something that has dashes in it, underscores, zero to nines, capital A to Zs, and lowercase a to Zs, and even an exclamation mark. And not only am I looking for a string that uh, in includes those characters, but it can be 10 to 13 characters long. Okay, So in the response coming back, we look for that string, and if we find that value, we extract that value, 
Okay, so we extract that value there based on the number one position, and we push this to the variable called ADF control state that we set up before. Okay, so these regular extraction extraction extractors will, in the responses, look for these regular expression values, extract the value, and push them to our variables. Now, when we get up to actually recording on a session, we then need to do something with those variables and those values, and I'll show you that in a moment. Can't yet show you that because I haven't recorded a session to show you what I need to do. But in the end, these are very important, um, these particular uh, ADF HTTP um, parameters or values, okay? Without them, JMeter, when it then when it gets a, sends a request to the server and gets a response, if it doesn't extract those values and then put them in the next request that goes to the server, uh, to the ADF application, the ADF application will complain and, and most likely fall over. So those parts of the test plan are essentially um, the configurations that we need to manage the requests and the responses. But in terms of the responses, what else have we got within our test plan? Well, one of the things we've got is something called the response assertion. Now, what the response assertion does is when it watches the responses coming from the ADF server, it can look for particular error messages. And you can see some ones I've set up here. Now, if you see any one of these error messages in your ADF application, it had um, returned from the server, it does mean that the application has crashed in some form. So this response assertion will tell us hey, is everything healthy? Has the application run through the test plan that we wanted it to, or has it hit an error in some particular way? Now, with that in mind, great, it'll um, um, stop at that particular error, but we, we really need to be able to see that error and dive into the um, actual requests and, uh, and literally the responses. And this is what these particular options are here for. We see we've got these, uh, what we call these, um, I'll just show you the options. We have these uh, listener options, and the listener options allow you to look at things like graph the results, report on the results, or even view the results. Of the most useful here is the view results tree, and the view results tree uh, will actually show us the requests and the responses that we got from the server, and we can actually um, dive into the responses and see what's actually happening. Um, we've, for, the, for purposes of the demonstration, I've set up some other um, listeners, such as graphing, um, view results in a table and aggregate graphs. Um, and we'll just have a look at those very generally to give you an idea of what's going on. In terms of running a load stress and particular performance test, having too many of these listeners actually slows down the behavior of JMeter. So you may actually get the fact that JMeter, when it's calling a server, will actually, before it can send the next request out, once it received the previous response, is it has to log and aggregate the results. So more of these you have, the actual, uh, the worse the performance of the overall um, system, which includes your JMeter browser and the um, and server will be. So don't overload your um, test plan with these, though they are useful when you are setting up your initial load and stress tests to understand what's going on. Okay, so at this point, what we've got here is the, the basics of a test plan in JMeter to deal with an ADF application. Now, what I want to do to you is just switch, uh, do for you, is switch over to the demonstration ADF application that we're going to use to show you um, and actually uh, to do a load and stress test. Now, I have JMeter running here in the background. Sorry, not JMeter at all, JDeveloper. I've got too many J's to talk about here. I have JDeveloper here running in the background, and I have a little HR application that I've previously written. We'll just have a quick look at that application. <clears throat> Okay, so we have this little human resources application um, based on the ADF UI shell. Uh, in that application, we have facilities, to, for instance, to open a departments tab where we may select a record, edit a record, and commit. Okay, so a very basic little application. And this is the application that we want to set up our JMeter test for today. Now, in order to do that, in order to um, replay this particular um, application, what we need to do is, okay, here we have the browser and it just made a bunch of requests to my running integrated web logic server. We need to get in between those requests from the browser to the server and we want to record all those requests into our JMeter tests so we can replay them at a later date. 
Now, you've either got the options of manually configuring all those HTTP requests in JMeter. That would just be impossible. That's too hard work. So JMeter makes this a little bit easier. What we can do in JMeter is we can go to the workbench and set up something called the HTTP proxy server. And what this will literally do in Apache JMeter is we'll set up a little proxy server running on your um, running on your PC, and we can then tell our browser to rather than going straight to the integrated WebLogic server, we can configure it to go through the proxy, the JMeter proxy, and then the integrated WebLogic server. And in doing this, what the little HTTP proxy server will do is record all the requests, or essentially all the traffic between the browser and the server, such that we can record those to the test plan and we can replay them at a later date. So in order to do that we had this HTTP proxy server here. Um, we'll set it up to listen on port 8085 and in particular when we record the requests between the browser and the server we want it to record those requests in the test plan that we've already set up. Finally we need to set up a URL pattern to say hey of all the requests going through the browser to the server via the proxy, what, what do we want to capture? And this is just based on a regular expression, so I'm just going to go dot star, and this will record everything. So this sets up our HTTP proxy server from the JMeter point of view. Now, returning to our browser, okay, and I'll just quickly close down uh, the existing application. What we then want to do is reconfigure, oops, wrong options, reconfigure the browser to go through that particular proxy. So in um, Apache Chrome, not Apache Chrome at all, in Google, Google Chrome, I would go to the internet properties, um, change proxy settings, LAN settings, and then I'd switch on my proxy server. And in this case, because I'm going to set the proxy server up on my local host and port 8085, that's what I configure. All right. Next, before I start recording the session between uh, the browser and the server with my proxy server in between, I probably want to flush the cache, the local browser cache, just so um, we've got a, a clean interaction between the uh, server and the, uh, I should say the browser and the server. Having done that, now what we need to do is return to JMeter and turn that HTTP proxy server on. So we go start, returning to the browser, we now enter the URL of our application. Okay. You'll notice that it was a tad slower, and that's because it's going through the proxy. And if we were to return to JMeter at this stage, you can see in our test plan, you can actually see a whole bunch of requests that have been created. And that's the recording of the proxy, actually grabbing the request from the browser to the server. And that's pushing them to the test plan for us. Now, I haven't finished yet my application, so let's go back. Here's the running application. We'll click on Open Departments tab. We'll click on the uh, number 40, Human Resources Department. Okay. We'll change the department name. And maybe that's the essence of the test that we want to run today. Now, very important at this stage, when we go back to JMeter and we can see all of the requests, and there's a lot of them, and we'll talk to that in a, in a moment, but it's very important that you remember to go back to the proxy server and turn it off. Otherwise, it will continue to record traffic between the browser and the server. So at this moment, great, we've captured all that traffic, all the requests that went between the browser and the server, and we'll at a, in a later date, we're going to use that to replay. Um, we're going to replay a session against the server. So hereafter, we don't really need the browser at all. It's actually JMeter that's going to act as the HTTP client to communicate to the server. In saying that, Let's have a look at what was actually recorded. Now, this is where JMeter isn't particularly nice. Okay, we can see literally thousands of requests. Well, it's not literally thousands, it's only about 100, but lots and lots of requests going to the server, uh, which it's captured. And you kind of go, great, but ew, what are they all? If we click on the very first one, we can see this was the first request that went to our server okay, on localhost. And remember, for my demonstration here, I'm running an integrated WebLogic server, so it's running on localhost port 7101, and the ADF application is served from there. You can see that this was a GET request using the HTTP protocol, 
And in terms of HTTP parameters, there was none, and there was no, obviously, because this is a guest re get request, there was no post body of um, HTTP form value pairs either. So that would be the first request that JMeter will send to the server. It will then, in order to um, continue de uh, doing the, um, the user session that we actually recorded, it would then send a second request to the server once it's received the first response. And in this one, you can see that it's sending out um, it's sending out, uh, well, this is the name of the actual HTTP request, I should, should say. But on the path, you can see that it's not only hitting localhost 7101, but you can start to see that it's hitting the application, faces, HR, and mm, J session ID with a big value. Okay, so that was something that it captured between the browser and the server. At some point, the server must have given that value to the browser, and then in the next request, the um, browser has sent that back to the server. In addition, you can see other HTTP header key value pairs that the essentially the browser is now sending down to the server based on the previous request and the response. And these become very, very important because of the interaction between the browser and server. And we're going to see um, that these values are in fact the ones that we need to substitute back from our HTTP variables earlier on that we set up in the test plan. Uh, but let's just consider some of the other things that are going on and all the requests we recorded. Now, very easily, I can see by these recorded requests, we can see things like icons, JavaScript files, GIFs, and CSS files, and so on, recorded between um, the browser and the server. Now, for a true load or stress test, you have to decide, do you want each um, user session to request those each time? The reason they were requested and recorded here is because I flushed the browser cache and it's actually said, hmm, okay, well, I don't have all these resources from the server, so I need to go and query them, request them, and get them back. Now, if you were to replay this particular test as a load test or stress test now for maybe five or 10 or 1,000 users, you're assuming every user that's hitting your system is essentially has an empty browser cache. Is that a realistic um, expectation? I don't know. It's really up to you to determine that. But for the purposes of the demonstration here, rather than getting overloaded with all these resources that we requested from the server, I'm just in fact going to say, um, let's just assume that the user already has all of these. So in terms of all of these types of files, the icon files, the JavaScript files, CSS, I'm just going to remove them from our load test. Okay? There's even a PNG file. As you can see, there's a lot of interactions going on between the server and the browser in terms of contents. For you. So let's just remove those. Cool. Okay, we've got a lot less going on now in terms of HTTP requests because what we're only, uh, what we basically left over now is with proper gets and uh, for. Um, <clears throat> real resources, um, and not not essentially you know GIFs and, and CSS files. And this is really now the, the really the data that flows back and, and forward between the server. You might notice I've got this entry here with no um, no name next to it. And if we click on that entry, you might see that the HTTP request up here is what the it's a it's an access to Google.com. Hmm, what's going on here? Well, when we set up the proxy server, we capture all traffic between the browser and the server, not just um, uh, between uh, the um, browser and our ADF application. Why? Because in the proxy server, I basically put a regular expression URL pattern that said, give me everything. Now, meanwhile, in the background, Google, uh, Google's Chrome, is effectively doing all sorts of other things besides uh, surfing my application. It may be talking to Google's uh, servers, 
if I have tools like J, uh, Jmail, uh, Gmail, I should say, open, um, it polls the server quite um, frequently. Um, and lots of other applications, not specifically Oracle or Google applications, are also have activity going on. So in terms of our load test, what we don't want is a situation where we're actually recording all those and uh, replaying them as a load test. So you either modify your URL pattern here to only capture your application, or you, as I'm going to do here, is I'm just going to remove these unnecessary, unnecessary HTTP requests to Google's site. Okay. Um, I'm sure Google doesn't want you to load or stress testing their servers for them. They've probably got enough load as it is. But in the end here, um, as you can see, we've now got, uh, I think it's about 10 HP requests. I can see another HP request here that's not necessary to capture. It's just a blank HTML page. Um, from memory, um, that's just a, it is literally a blank HTML page that's returned by the, um, by the running server. And again, it's not something we really need to test here, so we can remove that. So end result, now we only have nine requests. Phew! Now you're starting to get a feel how, while a Apache JMeter um, might be a reasonable tool for load and stress testing, you can see it's very configuration heavy in the fact that I've got to go through and manually, once I've recorded a test, I've got to go through and manually trim the test to get it to suit what I want. Unfortunately, in turn, that hasn't stopped here because we now need to deal with these session, uh, these HTTP uh, state variables that ADF is passing backwards and forwards. So this goes back to what we were discussing earlier on, that we've got these regular expression extractors that when a request here goes to the server and returns a response, these extractors will look for things like AFR loop and extract the value and put it in our variables. But when we rerun the test, we now need to make sure that it inserts those variables back into the, HTTP, uh, the next HTTP request. So in order to do that, we see these variables here. What we need to do is look through each one of these requests and put a substitution variable in. Now on this first request, there is nothing that relates to any of these variable names that we had defined earlier on. But if we look at the second request, we can see in the path that it has J session ID. Okay, you see J session ID there? And J session ID is one of our regular expression extractors which we then push to a variable. So what we need to do is go up here and use, as you can see it's a quite a long token, I believe it's up to 64 characters long. We need to replace that with this syntax. What is that? Well, that's a substitution variable syntax for JMeter, and it's, when it sees that syntax, it's a little bit like ADF EL expression syntax. It will then go off and find, attempt to find the variable called J session ID. Oh, here's the J session ID, and what's its value going to be? Well, that depends on what it extracted from the previous request in terms of this regular expression extractor. So returning to that request, not only do we need to substitute J session ID, but we also need to do here the AFR loop. These variable names are case sensitive, okay? And once we've done our first request, we then need to do our second request. Now this one doesn't have J session ID in the path, but it still has a AFR loop, so we'll fix that. Oops, typo. Oh, and it has another one that we're interested in is ADF control state. So you can see that there. Again, I'll have to replace that. And as you can see from here on in, I need to replace anything that's a variable up here. So I'll continue to do that. Um, I won't talk at the moment. I'll just quickly uh, copy and paste. You can watch what I'm going to do. Okay, so there's no more AFR loops. There is a control state one in the very next request. Okay, now we want to do a view state. 
Now the view state one's a little tricky because you need to leave the exclamation mark in there, but you then need to type in the variable like this. Okay, so you can you see the exclamation mark in there, then dollar brackets java x java x dot faces dot view state. So again, this is another one I need to go through and look for. Oops, two exclamation marks. All right, so let's just check. <clears throat> At this point, um, no variables here we have to worry about. Here we have to worry about the J session ID. You might be wondering why I didn't apply it to the name. Well, the name is just a text string, um, so it's it's not really, um, it's no point actually. Uh, it's just the name of the HTTP request as such in the test plan. It's not actually anything used in the actual real HTTP requests that go to the server, so we can just leave that as is. Um, okay, again, We've got AFR loop and ADF control state. Um, again, we don't care about that control state, but we do, this is the actual path. We can see the view state. You might notice some other parameters that are coming in here. Well, those are other ones that we can just happily leave alone. Um, they don't uh, require us to set up substitution variables in this case, uh, so on and so forth. Um, it's worthwhile me mentioning unique here. In all my testing, unique is not one that you need to capture. However, as JDeveloper evolves um, new versions, at some stage we may find that is a necessarily um, a necessary HTTP variable that we need to deal with. So at this stage, I'm leaving it out in terms of ones to substitute, but in the future we might. Um, again, we don't care about that control state. We've got these substitutions going on here, all good. Don't care about that control state. We've got that one working. We've got view states, and finally. We've got it all covered. Okay. All right. And so what we've now done is we've set up a test plan that knows how to understand the ADF variables and extract them. And then via a bunch of requests that we're going to then send to our server, we're going to substitute the values in from the previous request using these substitution variables. And we are in a position now to um, run our first load test against the ADF server. Well, little caveat. You've got to remember to have in JDeveloper the actual application running. If it's not running or running on your integrated WebLogic server or running on one of your servers at your organization, hey, this test is not going to work. But it is, so what we'll do now is we'll set the test off. At the moment, we're just going to simulate with one user. We're going to run clear all to clear all the previous logs from my previous run, and now we're going to go run start. Just before I click that, just watch when I do that what happens over here. You'll see that it sets up um, um, basically one session. It says it's going to run one session and then it will complete with one session. You've got to kind of watch what's happening over there very quickly. Okay, did you see that? Very quick. I'm assuming Camtasia, the video, the screencast recording tool here actually showed that to you. But it's essentially run that one session for us. Now, great, but how do we know what actually happens? Well, in order to actually see what happened, we go to these listeners and we can see the view results tree here. Now the view results tree shows you all your requests going out. And as a reminder, we have nine requests, but hmm, only seem to get to the fifth one. Okay, then there seems to be an error. We'll talk about that in a moment, but let's just show us show you what the view results tree shows you. So this here is the first request that went out, okay, and it coordinates with this one. You can actually see the information of the request that was sent out, and there's the literal URL that was requested as a GET. In turn, this is what the server responded with. Okay? That's our ADF server returning a result. And in all this HTML, in various parts of it, are the HTTP um, uh, session variables that we're actually extracting. You can see the J session ID here. And that value, so for WH and so on and so forth, is what is extracted and then used on the next re request. Okay, so here's the next request and you can see the J session ID was substituted with the value from the previous response thanks to these extractors. So you get a request response cycle, a request, request response cycle and so on and so forth. Why do some of our requests have a little expandy icon here, <laughs> expandy being the technical term. Well, for this particular request, when it sent out the first request, okay, so here's our first request coming out, the server responded, 
this is a little hard to see, we're with a 302, a HP 302, it's moved the resource. So this required JMeter, or in, in the case of our original browser, it then had to actually make a separate request to wherever that resource is moved to. And in re requesting that, again, you can see the actual HTTP request that it will make with these session variables, AFR loop, control state, and so on and so forth. And with that second request going out, the server responded with a HTML page. Now, how do I know it's a HTML page? I can see HTML, the HTML tag. One of the limitations of JMeter here is it, while it acts like a client or HTTP client, it's not a fully fledged browser. So it doesn't have the ability to render the browser pages and show you the result. You've just got to look at them and try and interpret them yourself. Remember, this is a free tool. It's not designed to be a fully fledged, um, you know, U boot tool um, to make your life easy. It basically is a very um, um, basic tool that allows you to do all the HTTP requests and, and, and expect the results, but you've got to do some of the grunt work yourself. Anyway, so as we've seen here, there's been a number of requests gone out, a number of responses. Great. Request, response, and uh uh. On this request going out, the response from JDeveloper, or I should say ADF, was because of inactivity, your session has timed out. Hmm. Well, two questions. Why did it stop here? Well, the answer is because one of our response assertions was looking for that error message and it tells it to stop the test if it sees that. The second question is why did we get that error message? Why we got that error message is probably best revealed here if we go back to JDeveloper and we can see that it's thrown an exception. If we look at that exception, Okay, we have something view expired exception. Okay, that's where the error message is coming from. And inside of that, it then uh, I should say a little bit above that, it says, hey, I don't know what this view state token is. Uh, view state token tokens, HTTP session variables. Ah, oh, so maybe what we did is in the session variables that we pushed back down in the next request that we extracted from the previous response, we either sent the wrong thing, we made a mistake when I was um, setting up the test plan, I must have done something wrong. Mm, this is really difficult to work out what's occurred. Now this is an ADF failing here, it's, it's working exactly like you expect it to. It's that we haven't configured our load test in Apache JMeter correctly. Now, oops, wrong page. In Apache JMeter, how do I work out what's gone wrong? Well, it's not easy. Um, you need to work your way back up the requests and responses and watch and check for those HTTP values going backwards and forwards. But deliberately in this particular test, I've made a mistake to demonstrate this particular problem. When I was configuring these requests and responses, because of the screen real estate here, one thing I missed is that there's actually a scroll bar on these requests, on these HTTP uh, variables. And if we go to some of these requests, and move our way up and down. Ah, oh, there's other stuff hiding. Oh no. And this means I didn't actually substitute all the requests, uh, HP uh, variables that I should have. Oops, and now you can see I've got view state. I've missed one. Ah, oh, that string, look at it. Minus Y7DV, so on and so forth. Turn to J developer. Ah, so that's the state variable that I actually recorded between the original browser and server session and I haven't replaced it with the current running session variable. So I need to fix that by again substituting the substitution variable here. So I've got that one covered. Let's just check if there's any other variables hiding away. No. Right, let's have a look in here. No, it looks okay. There are some hiding, but none that I need to substitute. Some more. Looks okay. Oops, I missed another one. Let's just go to the top there. So human resources. Oh, I missed that one. Okay. And that's about all. So with that little demonstration there, you can see that the configuration of this stuff is very, very, um, I guess, heavy or very, very picky. If you miss one of those state variables, or you get a variable name wrong, or you've got a typo, 
you when you replay the uh, test next time it will just fall over and it's very difficult to work out what's going, what's going wrong. Now ideally what would be good is when I recorded this test that we could get it, uh, JMeter to somehow automatically do all the substitutions for me. Now there is no way in JMeter to do that but just as an idea the JMX file that this test plan is based on is just a plain XML text file. So if you're, you so desire, you could potentially set up some sort of macro in your favorite text editor to do these substitutions for you. Now, I haven't set one up um, but because of I wanted to show you the basics here, but you're, you're free to do what you want. Just to prove that this worked then, let's now do clear all. You'll see that the view results tree is now empty. And now let's rerun that test. And this time you can see it's got further. But again, whoop, we've got some sort of other error going on. Okay, state ID and request is for a previous session. Uh, so that means I've got something else wrong. And I'll quickly just try and identify that. So, view state. Ah. In fact, you see up here when I substituted that variable, I had a typo in state. Again, just something you need to get right. I'll just check these other ones now to make sure I've got those right. Yep. All right. So again, save, run, clear all, run, start. Hooray, we've got all greens. So again, very configuration picky. You need to get this exactly right for the load test to run. Now, um, definitely some people will find this difficult, but some people should be okay with um, configuring all this. You'll notice in this particular demonstration too that I started out with a very simple test. I find a lot of people, when they see or read my instructions, try and go and record a session that goes for you know 20 or 100 different interactions with the server and then wonder why it all breaks and they haven't any experience yet in building up how to actually modify the JMeter test plan. So give yourself a chance to learn here and start something small and then work your way up to something larger. Additionally, one of the problems with the um, recording a JMeter test plan, and this is really true of a lot of these types of tools, is once you re uh, record a, a test plan, you are free to reuse it and replay it in the future. But if the program has changed the ADF application in, in, in such a way that maybe there's different variables required um, to be uh, submitted to the server, or they rearrange the screens, your test plans are incredibly brittle and they will die and you will have to rebuild them. So you find these tests are um, a kind of something that you want to do at the end of your development when things are a bit more stable. But the a caveat to that though is alternatively you really want your developers to sort of be doing this stress and load testing earlier on so they find problems. So um, it's one of those situations where there's sort of no happy me medium here. You have to find what works for you. Just in concluding the test plan, looking at the test plan here, we can see things like graphing results. Hmm. Not much in the graph here. Well, let's go back up to our thread group and now run this for f maybe five users for an iteration of 10 times. Save that, run clear all, run start, graph results. Okay, and as you can see here, JMeter is now graphing the results with number of samples, throughput, and so on. As it gets more samples, this graph will actually draw itself in a, in a, in a sort of a more uh, readable fashion. At the moment, you can see it's sort of scattering results. But you can really start to see um, um, the, the performance on your actual application server. Just a reminder, you can see also JMeter down here, um, counting down the number of uh, sessions that it's doing. And obviously, because this is simulating not just one user or one browser hitting your server, but lots of them now, this can take quite a lot of time to complete. In fact, one of the problems you get with using JMeter when you want to actually stress your servers um, at an incredibly high load is if you have your server often, often in a test or production server and you have JMeter running on your local machine, you may actually end up stressing out the CPU and hard um, memory resources of your local JMeter instance rather than the actual server. So a nice feature of JMeter is you can actually cluster JMeter um, clients across different desktops, across different um, um, machines to then stress your external servers. 
Just quickly looking at some of the other listeners, you can see here we're gathering statistics on particular pages okay, and how long they're taking to load. You can see here we've got aggregate graphs um, showing you the aggregate, aggregate um, sorry, I should say the average time per H H H uh, page, minimum, maximum errors, and so on and so forth. So this can assist you in understanding the relative performance of um, JMeter. Returning to the presentation, we've now covered the real basics of setting up a JMeter uh, test plan for ADF load testing. We've recorded an ADF session and we've rerun that session via JMeter. So you've got the basics. Just um, covering off some other points to conclude the presentation. In terms of resources, Apache JMeter, there's a link there, a bit.ly link there for you, and the Apache JMeter manual. Previously, in a different life, the, I wrote a blog article in terms of introducing using Apache JMeter, which you can uh, have a look at. That particular blog article is very generic. It's not specifically talking about ADF and configuring ADF. In fact, the next bullet point there, using Apache JMeter for ADF, in fact, covers, well, it takes off where that previous blog post um, says in terms of, hey, this is how you set JMeter up. And this, this second blog post says, well, this is how you set it up for ADF. And this is how you use it. The test ADF JMX file that I've set up for JMeter is available via that link. Finally, great, good that you're interested in load uh, load testing your ADF applications. Now, again, you've got this sort of the tool and you understand it now, um, how to use it, but what you're not really quite sure about is why you're doing load testing and why you're doing stress and performance testing. There are plenty of articles out there available on the internet. Um, Oracle has some of its own, but this article by Greg uh, ooh, I don't even know how to pronounce his surname, let's say Gahorgi, um, has a good article for you to read about what the difference between load testing, stress testing, and performance testing is. So again, people kind of heard the terms, but they tend to use them interchangeably and maybe have never done those sort of tests themselves. So go and have a read of his article, and I think it'll give you a good idea of the different types of tests you can do, and therefore the different types of tests you can do with Apache JMeter against ADF. So, one other thing I want to discuss in concluding the presentation is this point that, well, JMeter does seem quite difficult to use, and, and, and I agree. Um, I get a number of emails and a number of comments on my original blogs about JMeter all the time saying, hey, um, I, you know, I keep on getting this inactive session uh, message, or I get other errors. Why isn't it working? And as you can see during the presentation today, there are some bits where if you just get a character wrong or you forget to substitute one of those substitution variables, it will fall over. And without a doubt, um, it, this makes the tool tricky to use. However, JMeter is free, okay? And um, you know that's a good thing. Um, from my point of view uh, as a consultant, so even your point of view as a consultant, I should say, when I used to go between different clients and it, you know, it was quite hard to convince them to pick up um, new tools. Um, one of those reasons they didn't want to pick up those new tools is because there was a price associated with them. But with JMeter, hey, it's free and it's pretty hard to argue against that. Just as a caveat though is, well, what happens if you're still finding it too difficult? Well, there are some alternatives available to you. There is an extension to JMeter called Bad Boy. Now, I haven't done a lot of work with this, but what Bad Boy does is it allows you to actually um, record sessions inside Bad Boy and also view the actual real rendered pages. So it's a little bit more user friendly in terms of um, recording the sessions. There are def definitely other vendor solutions out there for load and stress testing your applications, but one that you may be particularly interested in, which of course has an associated price with it, is Oracle Application Test Suite. Now where Oracle Application Test Suite, or OATS for short, is particularly useful is in terms of all those ADF state session variables that I had to deal with, um, it effectively already understands them and uh, will take care of all that configuration for you. Now, at the point in time that this presentation was published, the um, OATS costs really, uh, it, it's kind of expensive. It's $9,000 per developer seat. But if you think about if you're going to set up significant amount of testing inside your organization, and you're gonna have people dedicated to testing for the life of a very mission critical application, OATS and that $9,000 cost will literally come down very quickly for you. So rather than having to muck around with all these JMeter tests, and you could have you know, 500, 1,000 JMeter tests, and having to redo all those configurations all the time could be a very expensive exercise. So um, OATS 
is potentially something you should look at as a good alternative. Um, it'll cost you a little bit at the beginning, but it will make your testers a lot more productive in the long term. So in conclusion today, we've had a look at an Apache JMinter for load, stress and performance testing ADF applications. There is no doubt it is a configuration heavy tool, but as I said, it is free, so this might entice you to use it. Once you've mastered JMeter and uh, maybe testing your ADF applications, I can guarantee to you and uh, your developers and your team that they'll understand what ADF is doing across the wire to your server a lot more. You start to get into all sorts of interesting discussions about, hey, it's not just about the performance of your ADF application on the server, but what the size of the payloads going across the wire are between the browser and the server, what the size are, the number of requests, and then you start to get into discussions about what a true scalable application requires and what you need to do tuning. So this is a really good thing in many ways. So many web programmers are still um, agnostic of that and um, then all sorts of issues on scalable apps. As an as a extension of this, then you'll also learn uh, some pretty interesting things about how the HTTP protocol, work, protocol works. And we just looked at some simple things like get and posts and HTTP requests today, but we already saw a 302 uh, redirect from the server. Okay, and there's an interesting little thing. Why, why did ADF require that to happen? Why does the browser have to make two requests instead of one request? Okay, so it's, it, it's an interesting thing and it's a very valuable learning tool. So thanks for coming along and listening to today's presentation on using Apache JMeter to record ADF load and stress tests. If you're interested in more resources or learning more about ADF and other tools, head to oracle.com forward slash technology forward slash JDEV. You'll know there, if you've already visited, we have plenty of downloadable demonstrations, tutorials, uh, there's links to our discussion forums, sample applications, and most importantly, our ADF developer guides. Thanks again for attending the presentation today. I hope it's been useful and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.